Welcome everyone. I'm Julie B. Elland and we are recording live in my sensitive empowerment community. I am a psychotherapist that specializes in the trait of high sensitivity and I am super excited about today's special event, Reiki and HSPs. And Emily Sauder is a licensed therapist, intuitive guide, and Reiki master practitioner, and has written multiple books. So we are very excited to have you joining us today. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. This is one of my favorite things to talk about, so I'm glad to be here. Oh my gosh. I think this is going to be so much fun. I've been wanting to bring somebody on to talk about this, so I'm really excited that it's you, and we have so much to learn from you today. Why don't we start with a little bit about like what got you into it and um, how do you think it can help HSPs in general? Oh, sure. Absolutely. So Reiki is something that, um, and would it, would it be helpful if I give a little bit of a background about Reiki first for those who don't know what it is? Yes. Why don't you, we can kind of come from the place assuming that we don't know about it. I think that okay. there's a lot of us that are new to learning about it. So that would be fantastic. Perfect. So I'll start there and then I'll kind of move into the other parts. So Reiki is a form of energy healing and um, there are several different forms of energy healing, uh, you know, throughout the world. Reiki originated in Japan and I am trained and attuned in the Usui lineage of Reiki healing, which um, originated about 100 years ago. So it's not this ancient thing, you know, it kind of has that like ring to it. And we always think of it. And I think some forms of energy healing are, have been around for years and years and years and generations, right? But this one, um, there was Usui Sensei, the person who developed it. It's something that came to him that he received the, the energy healing through meditation and was able to access its healing properties and, um, and share it with others. So basically, it's the idea that there is this universal life force energy that when you tap into it, you are able to channel it to others. And it's something that anybody can learn as long as you go through the attunements to kind of tap in and connect to it. And there are different levels. So the first level of training, you learn, um, it's called Reiki 1, and the focus is mostly on self-healing, which I think is beautiful, especially for HSPs, right? Because um, I think it also helps us really tap into our sensitivity as a superpower and not as a weakness. It allows us to start to see the sensitivity and the feelings as something that we can really tap into to use to our benefit. For those of us who hadn't been around a supportive HSP environment. Um, and so from there, so you're attuned during um, Reiki one and you can channel the energy to yourself and you can absolutely use it on um, pets and friends and family, but you're not encouraged to use it professionally until at least you go through the next attunement, which you actually get some symbols to sort of direct the energy. And this is the idea that um, you can actually, you know, send it to the past or the future. Reiki doesn't um, abide by our traditional ideas of time and space. And so using those symbols, you're able to kind of direct it. But the idea is also that Reiki ultimately will go where it wants to go and where it needs to go, where it needs to heal. So, um, and then there's an additional level of training for uh, advanced, it's called advanced Reiki training, and you're a master practitioner um, at first, or you can become a teacher as well. I have not become a teacher, I'm a master practitioner. Um, but so it's this energy that kind of moves to the places where we have blocks mm -hmm. in our body, the place where we've been holding, um, you know, negativity, trauma, things that are pervasive, of course, in our world that we all have different, you know, uh, levels of. And the idea is that it allows us to relax and heal. It allows our bodies to get to a place of healing and moving the energy through so that we're not having these blocks since the blocks can create disease and illness. So, um, so yeah. Wow. I, I love this so much. And I've actually heard so many HSPs talk about that this has really benefited them. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot for us to learn about energy work in general and, and how neat, like, how did you even get interested in it? Did you get exposed at some, like somewhere and that made you get interested in it? Absolutely. And quite honestly, I had to be exposed several times before I answered the call, you know, <laughs> um, I had a 
a friend and healer who I worked with several years ago. And she said, you know, you should really consider Reiki training. And I was like, you know, at the time, I think I was finishing grad school and I was, I felt like I didn't have the extra money or, you know, I had all the excuses. Uh, and it just kept kind of popping up in life. And then when I was pregnant with my son, my first child, Ardula, was um, a Reiki master teacher. And so she used Reiki throughout our work together. She's the one who ended up uh, attuning me at Reiki level one when I was pregnant with my daughter. And it was just the kind of thing that kept showing up. And you, eventually you're like, okay, I think that maybe there's something here and I should answer the call. And especially after experiencing it for myself, because to be honest as well, you know, I was a little bit skeptical at first. You know, there's, there's some openness that needs to happen in receiving Reiki. There's some trust and there's some uh, willingness to kind of, I mean, I kind of see it as a little magical. Yes, I, I, I think I could have totally agree with you. It seems like that. <laughs> right. And so you, you have to be open to that. And once I experienced it, I was on board. I was, I was fully on board once I experienced it. And I, so I was, uh, I did Reiki one and two when I was pregnant with my daughter, which was a really interesting experience. And then I did advanced Reiki training when, um, without her, which was really strange to not have her along the ride, along for the ride. Wow. This, this yeah. is, I, I don't, there's so many things that I want to learn about it. It's just like, it's even hard to figure out where to go with it. It's like, oh, I know. <laughs> I, I can imagine that, um, especially for HSPs, you know, we feel things so intensely and so many of us were not supported in the ways that we needed as, as child, as children. So I'm, I'm just imagining, I know a lot of HSPs have a lot of the energetic blocks that you're talking about. And I think that's kind of amazing. Like maybe if somebody didn't understand what that was, is there a way that you could share a little bit of information about what that even means to have an energy block and what it would look like to and feel like to release that? Sure. And I think one of the things that I really appreciate about HSPs, and sometimes it takes some training to get there, but I think that we have such a strong inner knowing and sense of intuition and a feeling that something is off and we can't put our fingers on it, you know, that we are sensitive to things that are going on in our body. So whether there's a physical pain or, um, you know, a persistent symptom or just that nagging feeling, like what, what is, what is, you know, not quite sitting right with me here. And I think that that is, I mean, I think we all have energy blocks because we pick up energy from around us and we often hold on to it because we don't know how to release it. And so that's one of the reasons that I include visualizations along with the Reiki energy, because as the Reiki energy is flowing through, it can bring up discomfort. And I find it really helpful to have my clients have sort of like a visualization of release as well on top of that so that they have this tool that's kind of supporting them. And, um, and yeah, so it's, it's something that can, when it starts flowing through, like I said, it can bring up some discomfort, which is temporary. And it's something that can release those toxins, kind of like when you get a massage or acupuncture, you know how they tell you to drink a lot of water after it's similar. Yeah, that's really interesting. When I was in grad school, I connected with a friend who did energy work and she would actually kind of practice a bit on me through the phone. And I found it incredible that we could do something like this through the phone. So it'd be interesting to even hear like, what is the difference between experiencing it in person versus through the phone? Or, or do you do videos? And, sure. and I find all of that really interesting. Sure. So yeah, I do, I do phone. I feel like video might be a little bit distracting and there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of, I think it's, it's nice to have that visual aspect taken away actually for this type of thing. For therapy, it's great. And then for this though, to have that sort of space. So one of the symbols that you learn in Reiki 2 allows you to send that energy distantly. So that could be across physical space, that could be in time to the past or the future. And so that's something that you use um, during your sessions when you're doing them distantly. And the, the concept is, you know, that you can beam the Reiki to where that person is using either, so there are lots of different methods and it's the kind of thing where you decide what works for you. I always use one of my kids' stuffed animals or babies <laughs> as sort of a uh, stand-in for a client. 
And that's how I focus the energy to them. Some people just picture it or um, imagine that, you know, the client is um, in front of them, like with, I, th I think one person said like with their head on their lap or something like that. Um, one person that I had read. And I will say in person feels different. There can be more powerful physical sensations and perhaps, you know, some people feel warmth, tingliness, and you also, I've had one of my clients after experiencing both in-person and distance with me, talk about feeling my energy a little bit more powerfully in person. Um, and so that is a difference. And yet so many of my clients have had really great healing and insight happen from our distance sessions together. And most of my Reiki practice has been built on a distance model. Uh, just because of where I am in life right now. I, I don't have a physical space. I, you know, I homeschool my three-year-old and five-year-old. And so uh, I'm the, I'm the main person during the day for them. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually I can imagine though, that this could be really powerful for an HSP even to do it through the phone. I mean, because like you were saying, I agree with you. We have this ability to, to be in a really deep place internally. And I think without the, you know, and a lot of HSPs have anxiety. So to have to go to somebody's office versus being able to do it on the phone and not have the visual distractions, I actually think that that could be really powerful. Yeah. And I think, and that's one of the reasons that I kind of roll in the mindfulness work. And I started, I was getting all of these, you know, I call them intuitive hits. It's not a term that's unique to me. I've heard other people use it as well, but I get all these intuitive hits during Reiki transmission anyway. And I was like, well, I'm just going to go and just make my sessions include that, you know, and that's what people expect when they come to work with me. Um, after taking a year long intuitive training and self healing course, um, the two just, oh, they work so beautifully together. I mean, and Reiki supports so many, I mean, so many other, you know, whether it's traditional medical types of treatments, and that's why it's being used in hospitals to, um, to therapy work, to the intuitive stuff. They just go, it goes beautifully with so many things. Absolutely, especially for the population of HSPs doing yes. this. Is there anything that you want to do with us or for us or share more about like that you want us to know about it in general? Hmm. I think that it's something that is very, I think that it's something that's very um, helpful as far as connecting with that intuition. And I think, you know, I mentioned that already, but I wanted to say that again, just because it's, I think that we have, you know, depending on the environment that we grew up in as HSPs, we don't often get that validation that we need, that what we're experiencing is real and that what we're experiencing is, um, not somehow made up in our minds and Reiki allows us to tap into all that is authentic to us that we can trust the things that we have had and have carried with us since birth you know that we're just we inherently have and I think that it's an invitation for us to reconnect and it's like that foundational it's like a loving foundation for being able to build that trust with yourself after maybe, you know, depending again on your upbringing, not necessarily having that environment, you know? Yeah. Wow. That's so beautiful. I mean, the work yeah. that you're doing is really beautiful in the world. And I, I love that. I know that there's a lot of HSPs that talk about the experience of trauma and getting that kind of energy stuck. And I know that like when I worked with my friend doing this, I mean, she was really good at it and it was so amazing like afterwards like I she would bring me through a visualization I'd have my eyes closed I, I remember doing it in my car because I had like no place to do it privately so at the time yes. so I was like in my car and I would like look up at the at the sky um, and uh, I remember just kind of having some sessions where I would just cry and it was just this release and I could just feel this release it was like I really felt lighter afterwards yes. Absolutely. And we need also those energy tools, like those visualizations you were talking about. We need those to be able to exist in this world. I mean, it sounds a little, but it's, it's true. We need those to be able to like set the energetic boundaries around us, which isn't something that, you know, we learn growing up, um, HSP or not, but particularly for HSPs. And I was, you know, fortunate that my mom is an HSP. And so she kind of 
clued me into that early on, but, um, but still, you know, having that struggle with just feeling all the feels <laughs> and, yes. you know, and, and um, absorbing, right? Absorbing, absorbing you know, everything. and somebody uh, in the comments in the event had talked about uh, being an empath. And I think that that's such a closely related thing. Um, so, so yeah. And I'd love for, you know, if anybody in the community would want to try a session, I'll, I'll give them 15% off. I, I decided I was like, oh, I should have a little code word or something. <laughs> so yeah, you can get that details to me. I can put it all in the notes. Yeah. I just, I, I thought about that and I was like, you know, if, if this is an opportunity for people to try and, um, to just experiment and open. I think that we shield ourselves a lot as HSPs. We shield ourselves and protect and restrict, mm -hmm. but we can open while also having those energetic boundaries. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. Can you share like an example of maybe a client that you've worked with, that, like the experience that they, that they had, maybe the, what it would be like for somebody to, to do a session with you? Sure. So I'll kind of run you through how a session looks and, uh, the client experiences are so different, um, but I'll, I'll, you know, run you through what a session looks like. So uh, the sessions last an hour and at the time that we decide, you know, to start, I have the person get settled. Uh, they give me a call when they're settled. They've taken care of all their bodily needs. They don't need to go to the bathroom. They're not hungry and they, they can just be in a place where they can be quiet, where they can um, be uninterrupted. And so then they give me a call and uh, I usually suggest that people either wear earbuds or can, they can have the phone on speaker or whatever works better, but so you don't have to be an effort like holding it to your ear. Yeah. But for the first 10 or 15 minutes, we just chat. We talk about things going on in the person's life. We talk about uh, areas of pain. Uh, we talk about things that they'd like to accomplish. And then we talk about setting an intention for the session something that they want to work through or identify. Um, a lot of times it's something like gaining clarity. And um, so after setting the intention, I run through a grounding uh, visualization and meditation. And that's something that I encourage my clients to be able to kind of, it's an image that I encourage them to leave up throughout to like kind of support them through our work so that as maybe images or sensations come up for them, they can let them release as part of the process. And so then for the next, uh, you know, I guess it would be, I'm, I'm trying to math here. <laughs> so I guess for the next, you know, 35 minutes or so, 40 minutes, I channel Reiki to them. And that is a process where sometimes I'm quiet and sometimes I ask questions and I encourage my clients to ask questions or ask about things if they're getting sensations. And that usually starts with a general aura scan um, of them, the, the Reiki part. And then I kind of work through systematically with doing Reiki on different areas of the body. And as intuitive hits come up for me, I usually either get a message of this is something to talk about now, or this can wait until the end and I share it then. So um, again, because the assumption in working with me is that like the intuitive guidance is part of it. I don't always ask for permission to share, but sometimes I do depending on the nature of the share. And so sometimes we do some visualizations around some pain points in the body or areas of discomfort. And after all the Reiki part is sent, um, we do another visualization to kind of replenish energy. And then I always and with drawing um, an oracle card for my clients. It's something that I started doing and it just feels like a really nice way to end. Um, I ask them which deck calls to them. I pull a card for them and uh, send them the picture and the text so they can you know, connect with that. Wow, what a great example of sensitive empowerment because you're using your gifts. I mean, your intuitive gifts and all the gifts that come with this trait to be able to help others. I mean, that's really amazing to imagine that, that you're doing that kind of work in the world. I love it. And oh, I'm going to go through, if anybody has any questions, you can put them in the chat. I see Cecilia says, 
Um, as an HSP, do you need to do anything to ground or shield yourself after a session as we tend to absorb energy, particularly negative? I think actually you asked that, Cecilia, before you even said that. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to say anything else about that, Emily? Um, yes. So yes, is like the big, the big answer is yes. Um, I will say that, you know, Reiki one of the tenets of Reiki is that it does no harm, you know, like that's one of the concepts is that it does no harm. So that's good. <laughs> you know, and I get a benefit from channeling it um, as well as the person receiving it. But I have a very intentional visualization and meditation that I do before and after um, the session, very um, both from the Reiki perspective where you kind of like, I like, I always like the physical like brushing off, but then also um, a visualization of sort of like, breaking and um, shutting off the intuitive connection to the person so that you're not walking around with this, you know, this open screen as my uh, one teacher would say, this like screen where you're just, you know, taking in and seeing other people's things. So, um, so yeah, I have a very intentional, like I even turn away. I mean, obviously I don't have the person in front of me, but like I'll turn away from the stuffed animal to like <laughs> break the connection, brush myself off and and yeah, have the visualization. I like hearing about how you're, how you disconnect your energy, because I think that a lot of HSPs and empaths, I mean, I kind of consider empaths to be the ones that score like really high on the sensitivity mm -hmm. scale. That's my theory, um, that we pick up even more energy from other people. And I think that a lot of us don't understand how to disconnect that energy. Absolutely. I, I love hearing how you do that. Do you, that's really, do you want to share anything else about, about how to support people to do that? Sure. So um, one of the, well, one of the great resources that I had was, so my teacher and friend, Stacia Sinistvet is a, um, she's the one who led that year long intuitive training that I mentioned. And she has a shorter course that's called Reclaim Your Space, I think. And it's, it's part of the year long training, but she also had offered it separately. I think she still does. And she had just these wonderful, a lot of it is visualizations. And one of the ones that she shares that I really like is the idea of putting a golden rose, like visualizing one, putting a golden rose at the edge of your aura. And that kind of establishes what's yours is yours and what's mine is mine. And that's something that you can kind of use to absorb all the other energy and then send it back up to source or you know whatever your belief system is is sending it up to the universe um to kind of be composted and come back to you in another way but even before that i think this was even before i did the work with stacia but she had taught me this too i've done you know i've worked with her for several years something that i even use in sessions with therapy clients and i so i i'm a perinatal mental health therapist i work pretty much exclusively with pregnant and postpartum clients. And one of the things that I'll say is um, to myself, any energy that's not mine, please leave. And the idea being that energy, the energy law is that if you ask it to leave, it needs to leave. And you're setting that boundary and saying like, I see you. I feel that there's some energy here that's not mine. And you know, it's not, you're not angry or, you know, forceful about it, but just being like, all right, I see you and no thanks. <laughs> Yeah, because you're acknowledging it, which I yes. think is powerful. You're acknowledging it also and, and doing something that separates it. That's something that actually I've kind of learned more recently in my life to to kind of pay more attention to that, what those what the effects of that are. How can I separate my energy? How am I being? I mean, I think as a therapist, we sort of do naturally do a lot of that anyway. But Absolutely. in terms of the energetic stuff, I think it's really powerful for a lot of us to understand how to do that. I mean, Becca had the question about an example of visualization. So you answered. I answered it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And there, those have always really worked powerfully for me. I have some clients, mainly therapy clients who visualizations don't work as well for. And so, but I feel like pretty much all of the, I don't know if it's, I mean, you can answer this more than I can. I feel like HSPs are largely visual, like, or can imagine things very clearly. Is that how you... Absolutely. Experience? Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Because the, the clients that I am thinking of that have trouble with it, I don't think they don't have the HSP trait. And so, but I haven't had this trouble at all with any of my intuitive clients and my Reiki clients. So it's just something that I've kind of noticed. I think a lot of HSPs find their way to me <laughs> from that, from that way. Yes, uh, that's true. Um, Becca has a great question. What do you mean by our aura? I love it. 
Okay, so um, an aura is the energy field around us that is obviously invisible, but the um, idea being that we have layers around us that each one represents one of our chakras. And I, that might be another question if you're not familiar <laughs> with chakras, so I'll follow up with that. Um, uh, actually, why don't I start there? So um, we have seven you know, energy centers or chakras throughout our body, the first being around, um, so our root chakra right at our pelvis and going up our body into the crown chakra at the top of our head. And each one kind of represents a different area of our lives. For instance, the root chakra has to do with um, security and having our basic needs met. And those are often places where we get the energy blocks. But then each one of those corresponds to these aura layers that we have outside of our body. So sometimes, and that's the place that I think even as HSPs, like we can, we, we feel it when people are, you know, touching that space as well. We can, we can feel that as well. And these are the energy layers that are outside of our body. So no wonder we can, we're super aware of it. And so those each correspond to one of the chakras. And that's why when I do Reiki, I often start, I always start with the aura to see if there's any healing that needs to be done there. And I often um, call in a client's healing guides to help me with that. So as to not overstep any boundaries, um, I feel like in the spiritual world, you know, to ask for help. I'm not, you know, just to kind of clarify, and I didn't say it before, you know, the Reiki, the Reiki energy doesn't come from me. It comes through me. And so I like to have that space of like, I'm here to serve and not as, you know, not, not an ego driven. Uh huh. So you're saying it comes sort of through thing. you and it, and it goes to them that way. So Hands, you're like the, yeah. You are channel the channel or the bridge. The mm -hmm. channel or the bridge. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yes. I love exactly. I love hearing about this. This is so interesting. Isn't it fun? And I think a lot of HSPs are gonna love this because I think that in in a lot of times we can't do mat like we have a lot of these experiences, but we don't realize that that maybe everybody doesn't experience it as much as we do. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of HSPs that we, we aren't un, we haven't heard about or learned about all of this yet, but yet really there's something about it when we're hearing it. It's like, yes, that makes a lot of sense. Isn't it so validating? Yes. And something actually, I just learned about one of those things with myself the other day when um, my husband just, I mean, he bumped into me or something and it certainly wasn't, it was, I don't know, we were like both at the refrigerator at the same time. And I said, ow. And he pointed out that I do that a lot. And he was like, does that really hurt? And I'm like, well, no, but there's something about it that it occurs to me as like jarring, even though it's not you know, from like a non HSP's perspective. But I realize I do that a lot that I say, ow, because it feels like an impact that's um, uh, just more, just more strong than, you know, and that could be like any number of things. And I was like, oh, that's another area that my HSP part is you're, yeah, you're feeling the hit of the energy too. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes I can relate wow. to that. <laughs> yeah. So the, would you say going into the aura a little bit more, the description of that, Rebecca, it, you talked about it being like the, the different layers of, uh, I will. Yeah. And I wonder, I might, um, I might try to find a visual for you if that would be helpful. Maybe I could send, I don't know if I'm able to share graphics to the group or in the event. Yes. Um, yes that would that be helpful that'd maybe be great have, okay yeah. I'll find we'll add that to the show notes for sure. sure that'd be really interesting yeah i'll send that to you yes do, do you feel like you got your question answered becca i guess we'll find uh we'll get that um that to you too that also describes it and probably that will be helpful um and i'm seeing Ce cecilia's question yes, yes. um about so, doing reiki training even if you don't think you'll do reiki on others right now and i think Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Done level one. Cecilia's done level one, but that's ago. great, Cecilia. Well, it's still there. You know, even if you haven't done it, just start, you know, calling up that Reiki again. Because as soon as you think it, and as soon as you set the attention intention, it's in your, it's back in your hands. And it's, you know, as soon as you put your hands on yourself or someone else with the intention to heal, it fires it up. And I like that my Reiki one teacher would always kind of say to like, keep her ego out of it. She'd be like, okay, Reiki, do your thing. You know, like not, you know, directing it yourself because it felt like, I remember when I first learned Reiki, it was felt like a lot of pressure. It was like, oh, am I doing it right? 
but learning that it was going to come through and do its thing regardless of what it needed to do and where it needed to go most was like, it was so great to take the pressure off. Yeah, because you're channeling it through you. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. To them. So it's really about opening it up. So and yeah, getting them to open. Yeah, definitely take level two um, as a refresher just for yourself. I mean, when I took level two, I had no intention of using it professionally. I just, I just wanted to keep going. I, it felt like the right step to take. And I find whenever I do another Reiki training, it sort of invigorates me again and makes me feel more in touch with myself. So definitely. I love it. Gaynor says, in so interesting. Do you notice certain chakras need more healing with HSPs? Ooh, Great question. That's a really good question. Huh. So I think that I'd have to do some more intentional, you know, almost screening of my clients. I suspect that many of them are HSPs, but I you know, I don't always have like all of the pieces to know for sure. But with that said, I think that something, well, I mean, it can be, I've spent a lot of time with clients recently on the heart chakra, which is affinity for ourselves and others, um, throat chakra communication. Um, and then the, your, your third chakra, which is right kind of where your solar plexus is personal power. I feel like this is like a channel <laughs> where uh, we get caught a lot. And I suspect that there's a lot of healing that needs to happen around the love and appreciation that we have for ourselves. Uh, you know, because honoring ourselves as being different in a good way. And like I said, in the beginning, honoring that as a superpower rather than a weakness or something that's wrong with us. You know, I had a, a huge story for most of my life and still kind of am rewriting the story of there being something wrong with me, you know, there being something. And so um, doing a lot of healing around that part and having compassion for that part of us that's always been sensitive. Wow, I totally agree with you about that. I think so many of us have that, have lived with that message for a long time. And, yeah. you know, I think whether it was from our society or from our family, just always that message of why are you, why are you acting that way? Why are you feeling that way? What's wrong with you? These messages all the time. I could definitely imagine that that would really change that part for us. And Absolutely. I love that there's people like you doing your work in the world that you're doing. I mean, it's so important. Uh, I also wanted to get just a little bit more clarity for listeners too about you know, what, what might they notice about being stuck? What might that feel like? Cause I think that there's, mm. you know, I know our audience has such a range of people from who are just now learning who all the way to quite advanced, but for some of the people that might just be learning about some of this stuff, what, what might it feel like to, to be stuck, to know that, that this might be helpful for you? Yeah. So I think one of the things that we might notice is where there are things that we want to accomplish that we're not, there's something keeping us from doing them. There's something getting in the way, whether it's, you know, we have the idea and the creativity, but the what ifs are holding us back, or we don't even know what's holding us back, but there's something keeping us in the same place. Um, feeling uninspired is a big one. Feeling lack of creativity, mm -hmm. feeling, uh, yeah feeling like you don't have that connection with your inner knowing. Um, I think those are big ones. And sometimes, like I said, it can show up as like a physical manifestation or discomfort as well. But I think that, you know, we can be quite sensitive as HSPs to that feeling of, of being uninspired or like wanting to do something, but feeling held back. I like, I like the way you're describing that. Almost like a, a light is out a little bit. Yeah, I like that. That's a really yeah. good way to describe it. Absolutely. I can, and I think it often shows up too in relationship issues, right? Because mm -hmm. our personal relationships, if we're having a lot of conflict in them, sometimes that's also showing up in those areas. Definitely. Um, Larissa's saying she's relating to a lot of this. Oh, yay. <laughs> Susan's asking, uh, can you do level one Reiki training online nowadays? So some people are. My, the last I talked to my master teacher, she was considering it. So
So this is probably going to sound confusing. <laughs> so one of the, so Usui Reiki, like I said, has the Reiki one, two, advanced, and then you can get the teacher part. Um, some people teach the advanced and teacher together. Um, it just so happened that my master teacher did not. But there's also holy fire Reiki, which, <laughs> see, this is where it gets like, even I'm kind of still figuring all of this out. But William Lee Rand, who is one of the biggest persons in the U, persons, people in the U.S. right now, who uh, has the, what is the name of the Reiki Institute? But he writes all the manuals and things for the Reiki trainings. And he tapped into the Holy Fire Reiki, which I'm still learning about. I believe that all of the, those can be, and they call those ignitions rather than attunements. I believe that those are on line or can be online. Uh, and I, I do think that there are some people who are doing the Osui method online as well. Um, and I'm happy to connect people with my master teacher. She's wonderful. Her name is Mary and she is just, she's also a massage therapist. So like back before COVID, like having like massage plus Reiki together is a really awesome gift. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That sounds nice. Uh, yeah. Becca has a great question. During the Reiki session, how does the unblocking occur? Such as is there a script that the practitioner follows? Mm -hmm. So the unblocking occurs, and I should, I should also clarify that this doesn't always happen within one session. This can be a process similarly, again, to therapy or other healing modalities where there can be layers and different things that come up. But the thing that unblocks the, the energy is the Reiki energy itself. So there's not a script, but there is sort of a flow that we follow um, as far as working from the top of the body down rather than working from the feet up. And there might be people who do it differently, but I definitely learned about the importance of sending the energy down out through the feet um, and through the body that way. And so there's not a specific, specific, you know, I think of a script when I think of like yoga nidra and like um, a specific working through the body. And it's not quite like that. It's just relying on the Reiki energy as you send it through the different chakras and then the different areas of the body to know where it needs to go and to attend to those blocks and move through them itself. So it kind of does the work for you in that way, which is really neat. That's wonderful. I wish this was more, a little bit more well known, right? In the, in the Western culture. It's, it's funny because, so yeah, sometimes it feels like it's really well known. And then other times I realize that there are plenty of people who, who don't know about it yet and, and, you know, have the excitement of getting to tap into, you know, what it is. Mm -hmm. And you answered Linda's question was asking about how many sessions basically that you would need. So you're, it sounds like it really depends on what you're experiencing. It really depends. You know, some people might want to do every now and then for relaxation and just general wellness and well-being. Other people might have something in mind that they really want to focus on, like, you know, a chronic illness or, or something like that. Yeah. Wow. Great questions, guys. Oh, this Those is really so good fascinating. Questions. I'm loving learning about this. <laughs> is there anything mm -hmm. else, Emily, that you think that would be helpful to share? <sighs> um, I don't think so. Uh, well, one thing, just since I just mentioned chronic illness, you know, I think something that this is something that can support all different sorts of conditions or, you know, but I specifically think about autoimmune um, disorders, you know, I have Hashimoto's and I know that autoimmune disorders can be common among HSPs. And so, um, that's something that can support that path for us, you know, as something dealing with something chronic. I'm just, I'd love to see some research around this cause I'm seeing so many HSPs have autoimmune, uh, issues. That's kind of, I would love to, I would love to read more about that too. Yeah. It'd be great to see some research around that. Cause I, I'm seeing that a lot. You're, you're actually answering a lot of people's questions right before they ask yes. them. Maybe that's the intuitive in you. Because <laughs> Larissa says, can you say more about chronic illness and Reiki? Um, so uh, help with neck pain and headache. I think absolutely. Linda says, does it help with neck pain and headaches? I think that it, yeah. And I also think that not only can it kind of help the energy flow through. And, and again, you know, there are those times where discomfort can increase a bit because the energy is finally moving through that area and you can kind of uh have the 
intention to keep the energy flowing and rather than closing around that pain, like opening around the pain to let it keep flowing. Um, but it also is a really good invitation to check in around what other things might be contributing to the neck pain and the headaches from, um, from an intuitive level or, or, you know, chakra blocks and things like that. Yeah. Cause I think it would absolutely impact, um, our whole physical body as well. If we're holding in something energetically and if exactly. to be able to release it, there's like a softening that happens. It's, you can almost feel your breath flow. It's like, because when it's blocked, sometimes there can be this tightening right in the body exactly. that can impact everything. And to be able to just flow that through and release it all, I can exactly. imagine that that would be so incredibly healthy, just kind of mind, body, soul, healthy. Um, exactly. Rather than like doing that hunkering down that we sometimes do, like remembering that we can, you know, experience some of that discomfort and that it can be productive and that, you know, it can keep us kind of on like moving on the path. Yeah, definitely. Um, and Becca's question is, is it possible that the unblocking releases emotional energy that may require talk therapy? It's possible. It's possible. And the good thing though, I feel like, um, one of the great things about being a licensed therapist is that I can identify that I think even sooner and refer people out to, to the people who will help them best with that. You know, if that comes up, what a great um, keep, combination of training you have. <laughs> it's, it's really nice. I mean, I keep my businesses separate. I mean, sometimes I'll incorporate distance Reiki with therapy, but otherwise, you know, it's important to keep, I keep them separate for, um, just for clarity and for, you know, we have to think about like the dual relationships and things. And I want to make sure that it's healthy for everybody, you know? Um, but I missed, let's see, I was trying to read the one comment above Becca's question that I started missing. Oh yeah. Cecilia's comment. Oh, okay. You felt skeptical until you had it done on you and there was no de denying the sensations. Oh, and that reminds me when I was, it was a postpartum session with my doula that I had told you all about. And I literally felt like there were multiple sets of hands on me and I've heard other people talk about that sensation and it wasn't scary or, you know, uncomfortable. It was amazing. I was just like, wait, why do I hear her up at my head when I can clearly feel <laughs> there are hands somewhere else in my body? It was incredible. Oh, wow. That's so mm -hmm. neat. I love that you followed through with this for yourself, like that this felt like a calling for you and you went it through did. the training and now you're helping people. I mean, this is, I think, so important to even to, for HSPs to hear stories like yours, because I know there's a lot of, of people out there that are wanting to do something and maybe it's a little bit different if it's outside the box of people around you, but I think that it's so important to follow mm -hmm. that within you, to to follow through because it's like you were meant to be doing this. Oh, I love that. Yeah, it does feel really authentic. And I will be honest in saying that it took me a bit to get here and own, own that part of me. Um, and not be worried about what other people would think about being out there or, and at this point, I'm just like, well, this is, this is part of me. And it feels the best when I'm leaning into that rather than kind of trying to like shove it aside or shelter it. You know, you're saying such a, something so important because I believe in that too, to follow that feeling inside of you. It's like, mm -hmm. if there's something pulling you in a direction, follow it. Like you were saying, it just felt good. And it was like being able to let go of the shoulds, I should do this, or other yes. people want me to do this. But in fact, we all want to follow that flow and that calling that brings us to this kind of work because there's all these people that are now being supported and um, by you and, mm -hmm. and healed by you. And that's such an incredibly powerful thing. Yeah, I love, I love this work. I really do. I just posted one of my Instagram posts, I think either this week or last was, I was just like, I freaking love this work. I just, I love it. <laughs> That's what I love. I love to see HSPs doing work that they love. Yep. You know, this is my whole thing about the sensitive empowerment movement in general is about really helping to HSPs thrive, to be able to understand that they have so many gifts inside of them and that these gifts are absolutely needed in the world. Mm -hmm. And you are such a great example of that. I, yeah. I love it. And I love featuring you. Um, so you. how can people find you? And what would they find if they come to your site? 
Um, so, uh, people can find me. So I recently rebranded my, uh, Reiki and intuitive business. It's called Iris, etc. And so that's on Instagram as Iris dot, etc. I think, let me double check, <laughs> but, um, but and I'll, currently, put all the, I'll put all these links too in the show notes. Oh, that's great. So, so yeah, it's Iris dot, etc. With the, etc. is fully spelled out. And um, my website is www.nestingspacellc.com. And those are the two biggest places where I hang out. I'm mostly on Instagram. Some of the things posted on my Facebook, but I'm mostly on Instagram. Wonderful. And, um, and Susan, to answer your question, I think somebody can totally be an intuitive without being an HSP. I haven't met as many of them, but I'm sure they're out there. I mean, I'm still learning a lot. Yeah, that's such an unknown question in a way, because it's hard for us to really know for sure. Exactly. I've, been think, I've been thinking lately that maybe not all HSPs are intuitives, but I actually kind of think all intuitives are HSPs. But again, my, my, uh, this is my own theory, and it, right. it changes every day because there's just so much still to learn about it. Right. No, I think, and I, I can definitely, I agree with you. I think that that is what you, like, that makes sense, It what you um, just said about the all intuitives being HSPs. And that's why I was saying I hadn't met one yet, but that doesn't mean that they're not there. Right? So I, I'm willing to say that, yeah, sure. Like, <laughs> you know. It's hard to say because we have exactly. a lot of science now behind the trait of high sensitivity, but we have, we don't have as many, as much science around intuitives and empaths and stuff. So that's what makes it really difficult to compare them exactly. Absolutely. But everybody has kind of a different theory about it. Absolutely. Oh, so fantastic. So if they, we encourage them to go to your website and to your Instagram mm -hmm. page to contact you. You sound like you have such a great combination of support for your clients. And I, it has been such a pleasure to get a chance to talk with you and to share you with the HSP world. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I love that you're doing this movement and having HSPs have the ability to feel empowered is, I mean, that's huge. It's, it's, completely frame shifting about how we perhaps have experienced life until the point. So the fact that you created a, that you carved out a space just for this is really incredible. And thank you so much for sharing me with, for sharing them with me. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you're in our community now. And you know, that's the thing. It's this, like this, this passion and calling that I have, because it's like when you see an, an HSP become empowered and go out and do what they were really called to do, it's almost always about helping people. And yes. making and like making the world a better place in some way. So this is how I change the world is by making sure we get people empowered to, you know, follow their callings and to get exposure to people like you. I love out that. There doing it. I love that so much. Yes. And um and Becca, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. I'll I'll put my email address as well for people. Yes, yeah, send me all the details so. that you gave so I can put it in the show notes. I will. Thank you, everybody, for the Sensitive Empowerment Community for being with us live today. We, you guys always make the, you have such great questions and you make the experience so enriching by being here. Uh, I love it. And Emily, thank you. Thank you for who you are in the world. Mm. Thank you for all the people that you're helping in the world and for, uh, for being such a great example of sensitive empowerment. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take good care of yourselves out there, right. everybody. And uh, we will see you in the next event. So thanks again, Emily. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.